and giving it to the FBI. We're going to have a full report on that one coming up. And there's a whole lot more to cover tonight. We are on the air for two hours tonight. And I have a special message from Lou Dobbs that I know you're going to want to hear. It's some very good news. So stay tuned for all of it. Our top story, everyone, President Trump's efforts to listen and come up with some solutions here to gun violence. The president today reiterating that he supports some new restrictions, including age limits for purchasing guns and ending the sale of so-called bump stocks. But the president also emphasized his support for the National Rifle Association, saying they are great American patriots who love our country and they will do the right thing. Fox News Chief White House Correspondent John Roberts has our report. Trish, good evening. It was the second meeting that President Trump convened here at the White House in the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas school shooting. Today, meeting with state and local officials to hear some suggestions and float a few ideas of his own. How we can make our schools safe. President Trump built these White House meetings as listening sessions. But on one issue, the president did far more talking than listening. We have to harden our schools, not soften them up. A gun-free zone to a killer or somebody that wants to be a killer, that's like going in for the ice cream. That's like, here I am, take me. Calling gun-free zones nonsense, President Trump pressed hard his idea to train and arm qualified teachers or school staff to stand as the front line against a school shooter. So practically for free, you have now made the school into a hardened target. But I think we need hardened sites. We need to let people know, you come into our schools, you're going to be dead, and it's going to be fast. And unless you do that, you're going to always have this problem. While a handful of schools have already adopted the idea, getting the sort of widespread buy-in necessary to serve as a national deterrent will be a challenge for the White House. So far, much of the reaction that we've seen to this idea has been negative. Does the president expect that he can get enough buy-in in order to send a signal to potential shooters out there that this is a hardened facility? You walk in the door, as he said a little while ago, you're not going to last for long. We certainly think so. Look, there are a lot of um, individuals, uh, leaders in Congress. Um, you know, the NRA has been supportive of this idea. Uh, a lot of other folks have been supportive of this idea. President Trump insists his plan could put an end to school shootings. But it wasn't his only idea. Tweeting this morning, I will be strongly pushing comprehensive background checks with an emphasis on mental health, raise age to 21, and end sale of bump stocks. Raising the age to buy a rifle or shotgun puts President Trump at odds with the NRA, which fiercely opposes changes. In a statement saying, passing a law that makes it illegal for a 20-year-old to purchase a shotgun for hunting or an adult single mother from purchasing the most effective self-defense rifle on the market punishes law-abiding citizens for the evil acts of criminals. And while the NRA says there's been no change in its position, President Trump believes they will work it out. The NRA wants to do the right thing. I've spoken to them often in the last two days, and uh, they want to do the right thing. They're going to do the right thing. I have no doubt about it. The Douglas High School shooting has ignited passions in the political arena. At a CNN town hall last night, Florida Republican Senator Marco Rubio was confronted by the father of a young woman killed at Douglas. Your comments this week and those of our president have been pathetically weak. On Capitol Hill, a group of Democrats sent a letter to Speaker Paul Ryan asking him to allow debate to repeal an NRA-backed amendment from 1996 that prohibits the CDC from doing research into gun violence. And the FBI also weighed in today, the acting deputy director responding to why the FBI failed to act on a January tip about the Douglas school shooter. Now let me be clear. There was a mistake made. We know that. But it is our job to make sure that we do everything in our power to ensure that does not happen again. I'm not making excuses because what happened was a tragedy, truly a tragedy. President Trump today also suggested changing the language around active shooter drills at school, saying they should simply be called safety drills because participating in an active shooter drill could be traumatizing for students. Trish? Hey, thank you, John Roberts. I'm with him on that one. It's kind of a tough thing for a kid to hear. Special Counsel Robert Mueller today filing new criminal charges against former Trump campaign chairman Paul Manafort and his associate Rick Gates. Prosecutors accuse the men of tax evasion and laundering more than $30 million through offshore accounts. None of the charges are related to Manafort and Gates' work for the Trump campaign. 
Joining me right now, former Reagan White House political director and Fox Business contributor, Ed Rollins. Ed, we'll get to uh, the president and, and the gun issue in Florida in just a moment. Sure. But first of all, your reaction to this news about these charges uh, that Mueller's filing. I mean, again, no collusion. I, and, I, and I think that's important. Uh, uh, I've known Manafort for a long time. and There's no one in Washington who would have recommended that Trump hire him. If you'd asked, he's, he's kind of always been in shady things. Really? Uh, I, I've known him for 40 <laughs> years. So, uh, you know, at the end of the day here, it was it, how he got there is was beyond uh, my amazement and a lot of other people's. But I think at the end of the day, he's he's paying for sins of the past, not sins of the campaign. And I think he, did, he had some shady dealings in foreign countries and violated a lot of laws. We'll see. Uh-huh. Uh, but, in, you know, in th there's a big difference, I guess, between that um, and, you know, his, his previous career. And Collusion. There is no collusion. I mean, I, I think even the report of the 13 Russians that they indicted last week, uh, the, the FBI said there's no no deliberate collusion. And I think anybody understands the word meaning of that word. Uh, and I think the reality is it's time to get this thing over with and move on. Uh, you've had a year to try and find something and they haven't found anything. And that doesn't mean you st shouldn't keep after the Russians to make sure that they don't try and do this kind yeah, of thing. But those are two again. separate issues, right? Two, I mean, two separate issues, absolutely. And as you and I have talked about, I mean, we shouldn't be naive. The Russians are always trying to... And they probably the always will be. And I, I assume that we're doing something in their election. Uh, I should at, hope so. At least, at least uh, 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 spending some time and energy to convince people that Putin's not, not a democratic process. <laughs> um, let's, let's move on to what's happening sure. right now. Uh, we've seen the president hold these listening sessions where uh, he's, really, he's really stepped back, shall we say, Ed, and, and he's let the people talk. And you've heard their emotion, very raw emotion. You've heard uh, their dissatisfaction. Uh, I should use a stronger word than that because the, it's just awful what these people have been through. Um, and he hasn't said a whole lot. He's let them talk. How important is that? That, right that now? is that is very important. Uh, there's too often people come to the White House and, and they get either lectured to by someone on the staff or, or certainly by the president. The president has strong feelings for a lot of things, but in this particular case, it's a very complicated issue. And I think listening to these people, let them vent their frustration and their anger, uh, even though he had nothing to do with this. But at the same time, he sort of represents the country and I think to a certain extent has the ability to try and move, move the ball forward. And you know I what think, else? The country heard that because absolutely. he made sure that the country heard that. Right. right. And I think the and, and the worst thing they can make of it is that he had notes on a piece of paper. I worked for president, though. You, you want a president? <laughs> yeah, that, I got a few want, notes here myself. You want right? a president that notes? Uh, <laughs> uh, so I, I think I think as as disastrous as this thing is, and one of the there's great disadvantages to being an old man. I've been around for 50 years. But there's great advantages too, and the advantages are you've seen things change. Before you were born, I was a university administrator. I used to argue with kids when they're burning down campuses in the 60s and 70s. I said a university is not a war, is not a place for war. Uh, uh, a university is is now the, the, the high schools and the, and the grade schools, and they're basically places for education. And we're going to have to safeguard them. And we may have they may look totally different in ten years. They may be like Israel, where there are armed camps. I hope not. But if we have I'm to okay do that, I'm okay with that. Aren't you I, okay I, with I am. That? I am. If that's what takes to save our kids, absolutely. And I think to a certain extent, uh, Israel does it. We now, you can't go in a public building anymore. You can't go on Capitol Hill. You can't uh, obviously go on an airport without going through security. And we may have to do that everywhere. And you know, there are, there are people on the left that say, no, 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 that's going to scare our kids. We don't want our kids scared. Well, I'll tell you. Kids are scared. They are scared. They and something scared. like that happens and Ed, it changes your life forever. Well, You're you, always scared you, you, after you, something. Well, you like don't want that. kids to be scared. You want kids to, and you, know, and you want a university, or not, or not a university, but a school, grade school, high school, to be a safe place where you can put your children in there and not have to worry about it. It may it, cost us some money. It doesn't matter. To me, to me, we spend tons of money and we, I'd rather see it be spent on safety for schools than anything else. You're here. So. I agree. All right, Ed Rollins, thank you thank so you. much. Good to see you. We're going to come back with a whole lot more special two-hour edition tonight of Lou Dobbs Tonight. President Trump committed to keeping our schools safe, meeting with state and local officials. We want to hear from you on how we can improve physical security in our schools, tackle the issue of mental health, which is a very big issue. Under my administration, gun prosecutions have increased. Since last week's Florida school shooting, LaPierre telling CPAC that Democrats are intent on exploiting this tragedy for political gain. Watch. They hate the NRA. They hate the Second Amendment. They hate individual freedom. In the rush of calls for more government, 
They've also revealed them true selves. The elites don't care not one whit about America's school system and school children. Joining me right now, the organizer of CPAC, Matt Schlapp, chairman of the American Conservative Union. Matt, it's great to see you. Uh, I I'm assuming you're having some fun there. Uh, what was the response of the crowd yeah. when Wayne LaPierre said all that? Well, first of all, this crowd loves and respects Wayne LaPierre's leadership on these basic questions uh, of the Bill of Rights and our civil rights. And this is a tough time for the country. Um, you know, I feel terrible, as we all do, for the victims of this tragedy. But Wayne LaPierre did the right thing. He didn't back away. He didn't hide. He walked out on the stage and engaged into the dialogue. And part of this dialogue is that uh, it is unfair and unkind to give the victims the impression that another gun law would have saved their relatives. You know, uh, the places with the highest crime rates are the places that have the, the, the toughest gun restrictions. They just don't equate to each other. And I feel like it's fool's gold, gold for so many of these victims. Yeah, I mean, I agree with you, but I think you'd also agree, and, and Wayne would agree, that there's no reason somebody who is mentally unstable, right. as unstable as this guy was, should ever have access to a gun. But, but it's a multi-pronged approach, right, Matt? I mean, we can't just talk about background right. checks. We got to talk about mental illness. We got to talk about school yeah. safety. Uh, we got to talk about our FBI that's too busy doing God knows what that they miss a tip like the one they had. Yeah, no, Trish, you're exactly right, which is, you know, the left likes to talk about gun violence, which I think is also a term that's not exactly accurate. All they want to talk about is the laws around guns. And they fail to talk about why we have people that are increasingly reaching towards violence. And I know people think that uh, it's all about passing laws. I actually think when it comes to our, this proclivity to violence, there's not a law we can pass. And the other part of this, which is, this is a problem of the soul. Yes, there are people who have uh, mental deficiencies that are prone to violence. We also have people that just do evil and bad and destructive things. And I don't think government can pass laws to change that, but all of us as Americans need to continue to make sure that uh, we're good neighbors, uh, that we're aware in our community. When people are doing things that raise alarms, yeah. we've got to take the step and we've got to call those authorities. And the authorities need, need to have to the ability to, yeah. that's right. right, and to take concrete steps. Yeah, I, I, this was just a failure on so many levels. And we're learning tonight, of course, of new failures that there was a, an armed guard outside who chose not to go inside the school because he was afraid when he heard the shots. Uh, it, you know, Ed Rollins was just on the show, Matt. and. You know, he said, look, it, it may come to this. I mean, you look at Israel, for example, and they don't have these problems because you know what? They have warded them off. They have protected their schools. They have they've locked them down to make sure that those that want to do their kids harm cannot. Um, you know, if we're going to look at all the things that we need to look at in terms of gun safety, isn't it only responsible of us? to also look at the systems we have in place to flag the crazies That's right. and to make sure that we're, right. we're, we're protecting those kids. I mean, I don't know what it's going to take. Maybe you need the National Guard there. Maybe you need a, well, a marshal. I mean, think about airlines, right? If you're on the ask is what was the Clinton campaign? They had more information about this than we did. A guy who was on my staff, he was noticing that hundreds of folks he had never heard of names were suddenly coming into Bernie Sanders Facebook. And they were attacking Hillary Clinton in all kinds of ways. He checked it out and he went to the Clinton campaign and he said, you know what? I think these guys are Russians. Yet they didn't care. They didn't do anything. Joining me right now, Washington Times opinion editor and Fox business contributor, Charlie Hurt. Hey, Charlie. Uh, hey, Trish. Why do you think that is? I mean, why, why would you just brush that off and not <laughs> seem to care? Gee, I wonder. I can't imagine why. It would have nothing to do with the fact that uh, she would want anything other than a free and fair election, right? Um, you know, it's amazing to me when I look back uh, at some of this stuff. And, you know, it's, it's great for Bernie Sanders to come out here now and be talking about this stuff. But my goodness, he had an army of supporters who were so enthusiastic about him and they wanted him to win so badly. And he absolutely rolled over for her and for the DNC. And then, and then for him to only now be talking about the fact that, that, that they knew about this stuff at the time that, that the, the primary was going on and during the election, 
th th those support <laughs> supporters must feel so disappointed yeah. by uh, by ha his lack of attention and his uh, his perfectly uh, uh, quite frankly his willing his unwillingness to actually fight on their behalf against not only the Clintons but uh, but the entire Democratic machine. Yeah, there was um, a Democrat machine. And by the way, you know, they got to lose that machine because it's not doing them any favors. Uh, I think no, any one not. of us could have told you that she was not a good candidate. There's a certain je ne sais quoi that you yeah. need, right, as a politician or as a, a, a television host or uh, a, a, as any anything else where it's involving communication. And she just didn't have that. She wasn't able to communicate in a way that got anybody excited. It had nothing to do with her being a woman and everything to do with her just not <laughs> exciting people. Um, but that said, I'm wondering, Charlie, if they knew that, you know, there really was no way that uh, some Facebook trolls or Twitter trolls from Russia could actually affect the outcome of an election. And maybe that's why she didn't care until, well, surprise, surprise, she lost that election. Well, of course, I mean, the only reason they're talking about any of it now is as an excuse to, to, to sort of uh, shine the light away from their own complete total incompetence and their inability to uh, run a good campaign. Uh, that's the only reason we hear about it all the time. And it's why we hear about it literally uh, nonstop from these people, uh, because it's, you know, they, they simply can't. Uh, but but I think that, that, that uh, prior to that, uh, I, I think that what it really reveals more than anything else is the fact that uh, they never, ever dreamed that Donald Trump could actually win that general election. Oh, I mean, look, I mean, she had the, the glass ceiling that was going to get shattered, right, in the big event <laughs> yeah, in New right. York City. And, and, and they didn't, you know, realize perhaps until the morning of that it wasn't a fait accompli. Right. And you got to give them, I guess, a little credit for at least uh, realizing that they needed to cancel the fireworks, that they couldn't definitely have those as a go, because <laughs> even the New York Times, right. right up until the last possible moment, was clinging to this idea that she would win. And, and Charlie, I know you felt it. Like, I, I travel all over the country. I see people outside New York. Imagine that. And every time I'd go somewhere people would come up to me over and over and over again and I'm talking all kinds of walks of life whether it was a CEO yeah. uh, whether it was a, a union worker uh, a stay-at-home mom it didn't matter and there was a commonality to that and they said I'm so excited by this election and I'm so hopeful I'm so hopeful that he's gonna win and that told me something you likely I mean yeah. we're hearing no. the same stuff yeah, no, it was absolutely incredible. And, and what was so interesting about it was the diversity of people uh, that weren't necessarily sort of the regular political types who were enthusiastic about the election. Yeah. It was all, uh, as you pointed out, uh, people from all walks of life, all over the place, yeah. people that you would have never expected. And there were a lot of people who were normally, uh, who would normally fall into the category of voting for Democrats, according mm -hmm. to all the experts, uh, but they didn't. And here's the other thing, Trish, that I think is important to, to you know, people talk about how Donald Trump, you know, is, he's gonna have a hard time winning re-election. The, the Democrats will have a different type of candidate. My question to you is this, do you know of a single Trump voter who now says he or she wishes he hadn't voted for Donald Trump? I don't know of a single one, and I don't think there are any out there. I think, if anything, there are people who are, are kind of warm, you know, coming around to the point, well, well, actually, you know, he's not as partisan as everybody else we've ever had. He's not as bad as... I think he's proving that, by the way. He's becoming more... Whether it's, yeah, you know, what's exactly. happened in Florida, whether it's on immigration. I mean, yeah. there are a lot of things he's doing that... that the base may not like, but he's leading. Exactly. And isn't that what and we it, need for a change as opposed to partisan politics? And it's totally nonpartisan. When you when you go through the list of things that he was talking about in terms of guns, and I don't support all of them, and, and, and the same with immigration. Mm -hmm. I don't support all of what he's talking about with immigration. Uh, but I, am, I, I admire the breath of fresh air. I admire the fact that it is completely nonpartisan. Yeah. And he's just trying, he's grappling for he's ideas it up. that he thinks mm -hmm. makes sense. Yeah, yeah. hey, absolutely. Americans wanted a disruptor, right? And they indeed <laughs> got it. What? And they got one. Yeah. All right, Charlie, it's good to see you. Have fun there at CPAC. Great to see you. Charlie Hurt. Thanks a lot, Trish. All right, we're coming right back with a whole lot more. Stay with me.
The vice president blasting national left-wing media members for glorifying North Korea during the Olympics coverage. For all the media fawning over the sister of the North Korean dictator, I think it's important that every American knows who this person is. President Trump continuing his dialogue with ordinary Americans today in the wake of the Florida high school shooting. The president met with state and local officials from communities affected by school violence just one day after talking with survivors and their families. President Trump talked about the need to fight back, in part by arming teachers and arming coaches. Watch. Instead of advertising, this school has no guns, we are gun free. You let the people know the opposite, nobody's going to attack that school, believe me, because they're cowards. They don't want to be shot at. So we need to let people know, you come into our schools, you're going to be dead, and it's going to be fast. I like to get things done, and to get this done, we do need defense, but we also need offensive capability. Can't keep having these soft targets. Anyway, the president also focused on real solutions and bringing America together. But you know what? You know what? The national left-wing media was in a total frenzy over these note cards. You see right there that he's holding? The questions prepared for yesterday's meeting with grieving victims were caught on camera, and they were widely ridiculed by news anchors, who I will tell you, they themselves rely on teleprompters, and they rely on notes. In fact, I have known many an anchor that actually scripts out every single question they ask. They never even listen to the darn answer. They're so busy looking at their note cards. Joining me right now, former Trump campaign manager, Corey Lewandowski, co-author of the brand new book, Let Trump Be Trump, an inside account of the Trump campaign. If anyone would know, it's Corey. Corey, good to see you tonight. Thank you for having me. What's your reaction to what we saw the media engage in, this uh, obsession over a bunch of index cards? Or rather, not a bunch, one index card. You know, the whole thing to me is really disappointing. You had the president spending time with family members who just lost, lost loved ones in a terrible tragedy, and the media doesn't want to give him the credit for doing what the American people want, which is they want a listener, a person who's going to solve the problems. Instead, they want to look at a note card that he has to understand what's on the card, analyze the card.